Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the HCD Research Vidcast. We have a name. Uh, we are now called HT Mindset, yeah. and this is season two. Um, so we're going to be, uh, we're starting a whole new season with whole new topics. We're going to do a lot of interviews this time around, along with some new technologies that are coming out, new research situations that are coming out, and some more topics. Uh, so lots of fun happening here in season two. Uh, as we are all still a bit in quarantine somewhat, right? Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, we are also joined today with uh, the president and CEO of HCD Research, and that's Glenn Kessler. Um, you can see him on the screen right now. When we do these interviews, we're going to be having us on the video uh, so you can actually see us having these conversations. And we'll have some slides, too, to sort of review some specific topics, perhaps. But without further ado, let's go ahead and start the season with um, who we are. So as always, you are joining the VidCast, the Mindset VidCast with myself and Catherine Ambrose. Um, I'm Michelle Murphy Nigella, VP of Research and Innovation at HCD Research, joined as always with Catherine. Hi everybody, yeah, it's great to be back and we're happy to be using this new format with a fresh new look. I am Katherine Ambrose, the Manager of Behavioral and Marketing Sciences by, at HCD. And like Michelle had mentioned, we're thrilled because we are joined with our fearless leader, Glenn Kessler. <laughs> um, before we start talking about Glenn's journey, Michelle's just going to share a bit about HCD. As always, uh, we are HCD Research. We are a research provider, research house. We provide a holistic understanding of the consumer experience, how they're perceiving, evaluating, responding to different types of stimuli. We use um, a combination of tools from traditional market research type approaches, all the way through neuroscience and psychology, looking at communications, packaging, product use, all sorts of things. Anything that a consumer touches, basically. Our approach can be called applied consumer neuroscience or behavioral sciences. Uh, and we do this type of work across all sorts of channels of the human experience from early stages of product development all the way through the end stages of marketing. We can do our work globally, online or in person. We've done it all over the place. Um, but without further ado, let's jump right in and see exactly who is our fearless leader. Um, so this is Glenn Kessler. You can see him in the video, but you can see him here. Uh, we have an older picture of Glenn, or is that a newer picture? Um, <laughs> Glenn is uh, the co-founder of HCD Research. Um, and, you know, Glenn, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history? Like, how'd you get started with this whole HCD thing? Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, so in the 80s, I spent time with pharmaceutical companies, worked for Hoffman LaRoche and Johnson & Johnson, and used market research, but didn't actually conduct my own market research. I got interested in database marketing in the late 80s and thought I would start a business that utilized database marketing in the healthcare area. After a few years doing it, I learned that the greatest application for the databases of healthcare professionals was related to market research. So uh, we started to add uh, analysts and uh, built it uh, around what our expertise was, which was databases. And it was a really good time to, to start a, a market research business because uh, in 1993, we were three years away for, from the internet catching on. And one of when the early- When you created the internet. And we created the internet. I did that personally <laughs> in the 80s. And- just joking, uh, just joking. <laughs> Yes. Um, it was something I imagined in the 60s, and <laughs> then it just turned into what it is today. Um, and early on, there was a lot of reticence regarding using the internet as a market research tool, because it sounds funny today, but in the mid-90s, there was bias, and the bias was you would only reach individuals who used the internet, mm -hmm. and since most people didn't use the internet, you had bias in your results. That's interesting. So, that actually does kind of remind me of things that we still struggle with today, where there's the potential that only certain types of people are willing to 
go to a facility to actually conduct market research. And you always want to consider those things when we are fielding right yeah. now, but I feel like you already saw that. Um, but again, know. even with technology, right? So like there's people that are willing to come in to take a survey and then there's people that are willing to come in to get wired up for neuroscience measures, right? Right, right, exactly. So it's, you might have somebody that's a little bit more extroverted or maybe more, um, you know, more willing to take a risk, I guess, because people, if you, you don't know what you're getting wired up to, they could be a little, if people are a little bit more cautious, they're less likely to actually be willing to do the research. So that's kind of interesting that those parallels still do exist today. Well, so interestingly, go ahead. Interestingly, there was sort of a, a line of demarcation when um, internet data collection became acceptable, and that was around 9 11. In 2001, um, I would say that up to that point, quali traditional qualitative research and direct mail and telephone research uh, were the most acceptable forms of data collection. But after 9-11, the in-person um, data collection, uh, interviews and focus groups and so on, uh, was not possible because of uh, a hiatus in people traveling. And then magically the internet became acceptable and the bias issue was forgotten and it moved on to uh, uh, closer to where it is today. So it seems like you took a pretty big risk in starting up HCD. Well, I think the risk was uh, in the mid nineties uh, jumping into the internet. Early on, we were suppliers to, of sort of the back office uh, internet programmers for a lot of very large companies. And the risk was that I wasn't prepared for them to copy the methodologies, um, you know, the, the internet methodologies. And so we, uh, a, a backdoor or back office supplier um, was a risk. But later on, we learned that what people were looking for was not a technology, but they were looking for answers yeah, and solutions, so right? solutions. So we uh, uh, built an infrastructure for both doing the data collection as well as the analytics. So what made you do want to do market research though? Because didn't you come from a very like sales background? Right. Uh, it's basically where the market took us. In the mid 90s, we created, and you can still find it on the internet, the first international medical meetings online. And we were um, doing uh, product introductions using these replacements for the uh, uh, New York City uh, invitations to uh, Broadway shows and then dinners and so on. Uh, to get physicians at that time interested in, in new products. We basically went worldwide and invited physicians to ask questions from researchers in the U.S. about uh, new product introdu introductions. What happened was that one large pharmaceutical company that used us, um, we had gotten 2,000 doctors worldwide to participate in this online seminar. And this one pharma company said, hey, could you ask those people questions? And we said, sure. You know, so <laughs> we so sent kind out of built the idea for you. Yes. We sent out 2,000 emails and uh, people hit reply. And then we were counting them and doing, you know, five lines and then across hatch. <laughs> and um, then they said, hey, can you do another one? Another question. And we said, yes. We did it's it. Pretty and organic. They, they came with three questions. I said, well, we have to charge you for this one. <laughs> and we, we realized that it was probably uh, something an opportunity. There. Yeah. And did you shift? When was the moment that you kind of expanded and you felt that maybe physicians was a great place to start, but let's start looking into other avenues, maybe other disciplines that could utilize this as well? Yeah, because you well, were actually doing pharmaceutical work to begin uh, with. Mostly, and, yes. Yeah. Well, something is interesting. I, I was thinking about it recently. The reason there was this 
concern about bias and early on in the internet um, and using it for market research, it was a hard sell. I mean, why make a change if I could still get it done in traditional ways? Um, and then I heard about somebody else who started to do it and I got jealous and I thought <laughs> it was somebody in Princeton. And uh, I thought, well, now we have competition for something that no one wants. And, uh, <laughs> and then after a while, uh, it became again, 9-11. And we started getting phone calls and people were saying, don't you do that internet stuff? <laughs> and uh, we said, yeah. And so we started to get some orders. And uh, the next milestone was um, we ended up doing early uh, media research, uh, communications research, uh, print, broadcast, and online, um, online messaging. And we were, again, the back office for a lot of the large media testing companies until they figured out that they could do it themselves. But this time we continued and we built an infrastructure and became a player in doing online communications research. But always kind of taking that risk of doing the next sort of technological leap, right? So yes. first it was the internet and then then you started doing this crazy thing called neuroscience, right? So, oh yes, what well, I invented how that. How did you get in the there? 70s. Yeah, when you invented neuroscience, the um, back with Ramoni Cajal. That's um, correct. Whoever that was, we were close. <laughs> College roommates. <laughs> Descartes, perhaps. Um, <laughs> so, so I can explain how that body happened. Issue. Now, why did we end up doing applied neuroscience in market research? And it. It started in 2004, uh, trying to get attention from the com from companies related to our entrance into communications research. We decided to do some PR stuff. So in 2004, we tested every Bush and Kerry ad, and with high samples, 2,000, 2,500 per ad, and reported it to the media. And I'll never forget August 18th, 2004, we reported one and it became us in this, it went to the 72 hour news cycle. And that have. was, yes, that was a <laughs> swift boat ad. And uh, then we became the experts on presidential advertising in 2004 and 2008. And uh, 2008, we got a call from a professor at the journalism school at the University of Missouri. Uh, and he was uh, head of the media laboratory. And he called and said, can we have your quantitative data? Um, we'd like to compare it to some other data we've collected. And I said, sure, what was the other data? And he said, the psychophysiology. And uh, I said, what's that? And, and he said, well, come on out here, we'll show you. So I went out to University of Missouri um, took a tour of the media lab and watched students get tested and then uh, said, do people do this? Like, can you make a business out of this? And they said, we don't know. We're not, we're not in the business of training graduate students to do this. We're in the business of uh, training graduate students to understand how copy, layout, and color impacts the brain and people's res uh, response. And so bottom line was we asked them to help us develop it. And uh, we went into the business of doing quantitative and applied neuroscience in measuring media. Did you have any and, hesitations about joining that because it was so out of the realm of what you, want, what you were familiar with from your past? Well, always looking for something to differentiate. Um, I felt real comfortable giving it a try. Okay. Um, because it made sense. It was in, an intuitive kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was uh, a small company called Neurofocus, which later become, became Nielsen. And uh, they were doing it um, using a slightly different methodology. And so there was sort of a, um, an example of someone trying to make a business out of it. Yeah, and something going we on. We decided to do the same thing. We had a we had a vertical, and that at that point it was pharma, and so we used uh, these tools to sell to our pharma clients.
Yeah, because I got to say, I was in grad school at the time. I started grad school in a neuroscience program um, in 2001. Uh, and nobody ever, I'd never heard of anything like this. Nobody said anything about it being used in industry in any way, except maybe in drug development, right? Where they were interested right. in how specific receptors might react to particular actives for, for pharmaceuticals, you know, treatment for obesity or treatment for schizophrenia, something like that, or understanding schizophrenia. Um, but yeah, no one ever really talked about its use, neuroscience's use in, in, market research. I never even heard of market research when I was in grad school. Um, you know, so it, it's kind of interesting. So how did we transition to where we are, which is uh, testing media and product experience? I'll, uh, I have to thank Michelle uh, <laughs> for having introduced the concept because when... No, she uh, it, remember? <laughs> she invented it, yeah. And, and, and she... We, she was um, looking for local uh, applied neuroscience or neuromarketing companies, and there were not too many. But in, <laughs> no. in, certainly in Flemington, New Jersey, we were the only one. And uh, yeah. in speaking, <laughs> she said, you know, I can do the media stuff. I, I can learn that. But there's a whole world out there with product testing. And uh, we, I thought, let's give it a try. And um, Michelle came on and taught us about this whole new world. And the, when, as soon as she put her uh, LinkedIn, made the change in her LinkedIn, we started getting some phone calls. So I and thought- my first wow. day um, when we went out, like I didn't even go to the office. I went directly with Allison and Marcella to a client meeting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was, uh, and if I'm not mis mistaken, we actually got a, uh, a project. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. Uh, from that. So I thought, <laughs> what a genius I am. <laughs> because I once again recognized a new market opportunity and then searched for someone to help me do it. Uh, but actually, to that for sure, because, um, you know, you could have done underwater basket weaving, but you decided to do yeah. neuroscience and it's well, got a hold. Well, it was one of those lucky things. It was lucky that these professors called from uh, Missouri and it was lucky that uh, we got connected because as uh, life has turned out, applications for uh, testing products are at least as great and probably much greater than only testing media. Yeah. So, uh, and it gives us significant differentiation being able to do both. Yeah, and probably, you know, deal with the different fluctuations in the market as well. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think it's really you, interesting too to just hear the history of HCV and learn that even from the beginning, there was close ties in recognizing the value in what is taught and what is learned in academia and bringing it into industry and kind of helping yeah. to learn and really be flexible with the hurdles that you're going to inevitably have when you're making that jump from. Well, I think that that, that is a real strength of Glenn's that um, there is this connection back to academia, right? I mean, cause we're dealing Definitely. with very technical things um, and, you know, being able to work with academics, PhDs, grad students, people publishing work, Keeping that open keeps us open, right? Well, one of the breakthroughs was uh, just by chance. I was at a, a party and met the chairman of the marketing department at Fordham University, uh, Dr. Arthur Cover, And we talked and I, he asked, what do you do? And I said, we're doing it using the internet to uh, um, do market research. And he said, I have an idea. And, and he ended up coming on as a consultant and helped us build the um, uh, communications research tool, which is the basis of some other large companies who used us and basically made it their own. And I mean, that uh, is the problem with technology to some degree and being on the cutting edge is that someone's always going to be at your heels, right? Absolutely. And it, to go back to my 70s uh, uh, graduate school, um, there was one famous one that I felt like all through the 2000s as we got knocked off. And that was at the Bomar brain. The Bomar brain was the first calculator mm -hmm. and it got eclipsed by Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. And that's all, what you just said is always the risk. Bomar brain is well known in texts, 
but it didn't sell because mm. they were early. Yeah. And it, it's a marketing thing. It's basically taking a good idea and making sure you can uh, uh, get it out, disperse yeah. it to the market. PI quickly. is still used by students. Yeah. I had one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> so kind of thinking about that, you know, with your ties to, to academia, um, one thing that's pretty cool is that we're still involved in academia. Like we're a market research company, but you know, you have a lot of close friends and colleagues that are academics and invite you in to speak. Like, how's that for you? Yeah. Um, it's really been helpful and it's been helpful in a few ways. It feels great because in the, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, we were doing classes at Rector's MBA program and met some really good people who some of them joined us and uh, they were learning what we do as we were learning it because especially when we got involved with uh, early on with uh, applied neuroscience uh, you couldn't hire anyone with experience but if you brought in a bright uh, student uh, either undergraduate or MBA and they grow up in this um, they can innovate and, and that's what's happened. But we've continued to do classes with uh, at Wharton College of New Jersey, um, at Drexel. Lehigh, Drexel. Okay. Um, we've still done, we've done Rutgers uh, in the last year or so. Michigan State. Michigan yep. State, yes. College. <laughs> University of South Carolina. Um, yep. I did that one a couple times. And uh, it's just great. And there's a great deal of interest. And what we do is is still very new. Um, it's gaining acceptance in many large companies, but still, it, it's, uh, there's an innovation, and people have not been teaching it um, at universities. I think yeah. it's great that you're bringing that exposure to students because, kind of as Michelle alluded to before, she wasn't even aware that market research right. was a thing as she was going through, you know, her academic career. And yeah. I felt kind of similarly that unless I really pushed to to really find these specific fields i would have never known that they had existed um, yeah there's really, not a textbook that says you know jobs in in neuroscience or jobs you know industry jobs in, in any of these mm -hmm. you know, communications it, it's funny or like that it's funny this morning i got an email from a professor at nyu who i didn't know who was uh networked to me and was exploring ways to help students uh, during this COVID time. Mm. What can I do uh, to help especially seniors who are going to graduate at a time when there will be very few jobs? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it was, I, I don't know how he networked question. me, but, yeah. but it was, they need resume items. And in 2023, um, when this whole thing is over and the recession is over, um, they're not going to hire students from 2020 or 2021 they're going to hire students from 2023 so mm -hmm. how do you get value in those years so they'll yeah. hire somebody graduating in 2020 or 2021 that's really and interesting. Uh, yeah it, it, it actually it was uh, just happened this morning and that could uh, be its own uh vidcast in and of itself like absolutely what in the world oh. do you do to get a job you know <laughs> yeah well i i said create a mini McKinsey with smart yeah. seniors and have them work with companies like ours. That's and the trade is that they get to put it in their resume and if they do a good job, we vouch for them. And they can bring, uh, I was born in 1953 and I said to the professor, they have to be born after 1953 <laughs> because they probably have ideas that are newer than mine. <laughs> and so uh, we may experiment with getting a, a finance, marketing, communications research um, students uh, and, like a think tank. Uh, and psychology. And I also yeah. said psychology and let a team give us ideas. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I like that. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's very fun to work at HCD. <laughs> and uh, we... Uh, I just had a, someone we consult with actually just recently asked me, um, she sent me a message and she said, is everybody at HCD as nice as they seem? Is there something going on that I don't understand? 
And I said, no, they really are. Like, it's a really fun place to work. And I think I told her that the reason I think that is, is because kind of like what you instill from the top kind of goes through the whole organization, that we're a very fun place. Everybody's friendly and helpful and people contribute a lot because, you know, we're all kind of in this together, right? Um, so tell us, what's the story behind the, um, the outfit you have here? <laughs> so uh, I, that was right after I discovered CBD. <laughs> and I was really, really relaxed. Uh, my, my, my son, when he was little, was a big Barney fan. And when he was five, I told him that I would introduce him to Barney um, at his bar mitzvah. And he said, oh, I would like that, Daddy. And sure enough, he was 13 and all of his cool friends were at this party. And uh, Barney walked in and he remembered <laughs> what I had told him when he was five. And I've kept that costume at, and at important events like weddings and uh, parties where people are aware of that story. That's how I come dressed. I love it. <laughs> love it. Great. We always have a good time at HCD, so it's always fun. Um, and I know you're dying to tell us, so tell us about music of the 60s. <laughs> well, music in the 60s was defined by uh, Bob Dylan, pre-electric up to 1965 and after 1965 when he invented the rest of rock um, <laughs> through uh, his electric music. And that's a fact that's been documented and that's all I have to say. Okay. Fair enough. For those of you that don't know, uh, Glenn loves to talk about the music of the 60s. Um, <laughs> yes, I've and, a lot absolutely my had to that. about music and, from the sixties. <laughs> and thankful for COVID today uh, and yesterday and Monday, I've been in my office. No one's been here, or very few people, and so I can blast the music. And when I'm home, my wife, we fight. We have very few fights, but one of them is over the volume of music. But in the office, because no one's here, I'm just having a great time. It's all <laughs> I'm at home right now and I could hear the music. <laughs> yes. So, so, thank uh, you so much for joining us. Um, oh, this was fun. Thank you for putting yeah. this together. Um, you know, as always, we, we have great conversations here, but it's great to get everybody some insight into who we are, how we came to be, and, you know, introduce some of the other members of the team, particularly the one that founded us. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. Don't forget to tweet with us. Um, follow us at HCD Neuroscience or see our blog where we've been writing some really cool stuff about the latest technologies beyond the internet. Um, so check us out there. Definitely link with us on LinkedIn. And don't forget to like and subscribe to, to this uh, vidcast. We have lots of episodes from season one. We're so excited about kicking off season two. So hit like, hit subscribe, get the latest, and uh, join us along this journey. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Talk to you thank soon. Thank you.